Difficult things are important things usually. Well, at six years of age, my mom got diagnosed with terminal cancer. She died when I was 12. You've got such a vast understanding of this of this area of, of, of life. Like Victorian era, we say we had a better connection with death in the Victorian era. And they apparently, First and Second World War, created this disconnect in society with death. Because that's when the detachment started. And what I say is we learn about how life begins in school, so let's learn how it ends. So, John, thank you so much for joining me, mate. It's um, it's great to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here, Reese. Thank you for, for asking me to join you. Yeah, you know, uh, I was introduced uh, to yourself um, a few weeks back uh, by a mutual friend. And uh, I saw your your YouTube channel. I saw the work that you're doing. And, you know, on on this channel, I'm, I'm really pushing now the mental health side of things. Um, more so at men, but in you know, in general as well, the mental health story that we all need to be talking about. And I thought, after seeing your channel and the mission that you're on, I thought, this is absolutely, of course, this is part of the journey. You know, talking about death and talking about, you know, everything that goes with it, um, raising awareness and being more comfortable um, with this idea that we're all, you know, well, with the one thing really that we're all, we've all got in common. Would you mind, John, just go briefly into sort of your background, um, just introduce who you are and, um, and I suppose really, you know, what, what, why you're here. Yeah, certainly race be more than happy to do so. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've, I've sort of grown up, uh, and around m- my family funeral service in Bridge North, Shropshire, Perry and Phillips, and death was very much part of our, our home, you know, and that sounds morbid and all oh, that sounds like a terrible childhood, but actually when my dad wasn't there Christmas day, it's because he was taking care of a family who were grieving. And I never once felt bitter or, um, felt angry by that. I felt, I just knew the importance of what my dad was doing. So straight away, there was that level of, um, gratitude for what we had, um, which I feel, as I said, looking back now, where it all starts from. Um, so that's my sort of early, early years. And, I remember seeing my first person that had passed away. I was possibly a little bit too young to see someone who had died, but, you know, to go through that and to understand about life and death, not to fully understand the depth of it, but to understand that we die, um, hard, but important. And that's what I'm learning, all the things that I'm doing now. Difficult things are important things, usually. Um, At 12 years of age, well, at six years of age, my mom got diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, She was given a year to live. Um, but she went on for six years and she, she died when I was 12 and the experience at school was just normal. And that's the, the normal for me isn't good enough. It's a really poor, um, levels of communication and like community, community and people, it can be incredible when people could connect, it inspires me. And I just think it can be so much better. So that experience at the time, obviously I, I never thought about that I just felt very isolated and for me my answer to do, to get through that was to take myself out of school just as much as I could and I felt embarrassed at other people really um when they were discussing like Mother's Day and they're like I think there was suddenly you could see them think oh gosh John's mom's died this is awkward so it can be all you know you can't remove sadness but you can improve the whole t- the whole experience the whole journey um so that happened when I was young and I joined the military when I was 18. Uh, I had eight years in the Royal Navy. I was qualified to the like, highest classification of, of secrecy um, as an elect- electronic warfare director, which I really enjoyed. Um, it sounds then, John, like you've been quite, you've been on, on quite a journey for the last, I don't know, how many years, 10, 15 years or so since you've been doing this business. It sounds as though that you've, you've really got a good grasp of, you know, this whole side of life that really doesn't get exposed too much. It doesn't get quite much, quite as much limelight for obvious reasons. Um, but you know, this is why I was so fascinated to come and speak to you because you've got such a vast understanding of this, of this area of, of, of life. I'd imagine you've seen so much, um, you know, in terms of bereavement and, you know, even just, trying to 
come to terms with bereavement, a, a loss of a loved one. You know, you've experienced it yourself. Um, and so now it sounds as though then you're on a real mission in life to, to, to help spread this message, to, to, to raise awareness. So this is what your YouTube channel now is all about, right? Yeah. So yeah, the channel is, it's all about empowering society. What my goal is, is to educate people. So be, firstly, it's, I'm a big believer in like fixing the roof while the sun is shining. You know, don't just be reactive. So, you know, you have an issue and suddenly it's all hands to the pumps. Well, actually get a few things in order before there's a problem. And actually then the problem isn't as bad as it, as it would be. So, so yeah. So you you care the board done, right? Oh, massively, massively. So yeah. it's about education. It's about empowerment. And it's, those words are like thrown around a lot, but actually it's about showing people um, some serious bad stuff out there but actually some inspiring stories and actually education. And actually what I want to do is challenge society. I want to challenge society about how they treat, how we treat each other and then standards of services out there, how we all improve. There's a funeral director that I, I look, who looked after me about eight or nine years ago. I not long left the Navy. I went to his facility and we used his funeral home overnight because it was a, a funeral at a distance. So it was a long way from where I'm based. Okay. Well, the night before, I went into his mortuary space and there was just the same type of coffin was everywhere. I went into his office for a cup of tea with him and nice to meet you and all the usual. And he said to me, any questions, John, about my business? I said, yeah, yes, everyone seems to be in their, the coffins already. I was like, how do you manage that? How do you do that? He said, well, we, when we go and do the collection of someone who's died, we do it in their coffin. I said, okay, well, that's, that's different then. I said, but what about if they change their mind about what coffin they want? And he says, like, yeah, I remember he tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, you give him a choice. And I was like, of course. Like, it's all about choice and personalization. And with choice comes growth because it's, it's empowerment. That they have that. They've been involved there. He tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, you got a lot to learn, you have, lad. And I remember thinking, no, 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 no. I, I smiled. I was like, okay. I smiled. I thought, no, no, you've got a lot to learn. And I thought, it's the whole industry, you know, not the whole industry. There's some great funeral directors out there, but... It needs, people need, we need to shine a light on the funeral industry because it's so special what's going on, the level of work. But actually what needs to happen is I want bereaved people to go into their funeral home and say, um, I want to be the last person to see my mom in the chapel arrest. And if the funeral director says, no, sorry, you can't do that here. I want the family to say, no, 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 it's my mom. I'm doing it. If you can't do it, I'll go somewhere else. Because that's what I say is like when someone comes into our care, that person doesn't become ours. It's still theirs. And it's about giving people control back and like make sure they retain control. And actually by giving choice and actually suggesting things, I call them connection points. And that's like being involved in certain areas. It can really help you forward with your grief. So it's not just some ploy to look cool or look good. It's a, this is about how we move forward in society and mental health that you mentioned. I'm not interested in like right, right now. I've got, I've got an awareness of it, but I'm interested where you're going to be with your mental fitness in like five years time, in 10 years time. And I think if I communicate the message correctly to you, you will make decisions which will help you help yourself, help the version of you in five, 10 years time. And that's really important. And a lot of us now, we're not very good at doing that. We're all just, we want an easy life. There's a big rise now in the UK of an unattended direct cremation. And the coffin is taken straight to crematorium. No family go. So I'm all about connection points. There's none at all. But I'm meeting people now a year later who have this. And they're really struggling with their grief because they've had no opportunity to physically say goodbye. So it's educate, education, really. It's education and empowering, giving control. And actually shining a light on the funeral industry. Because as I say, there are some fantastic... I'm not on my own doing this. There's funeral directors all over the UK doing this great work. And it's about really now shining the light on them to show public what they've got and actually how lucky they are. You call at 3 a.m. in the morning and these guys turn up every time. They're there. They're reliable. They're consistent. They care deeply. And that's something that we should celebrate. Yeah, what you just said there, John, is, has really touched a nerve. And it's, you know, it's, it's quite... Um, it makes you wonder really where we are in terms of society, modern society in general, uh, you know, not just the mental health side of things, you know, but there's all sorts of 
there's it's a multifaceted i think there's there's so many issues at play and it goes beyond just the subject of death and bereavement but i think death and bereavement would be so much easier if we sorted out the multitude of issues that we're facing like a lack of connection a lack of community um and 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 just overall mental health and a sort of re- really a sort i've mentioned this to you before a sort of a higher spiritual connection you know it doesn't have to be the word religion right because that comes with all kinds of baggage but it's i genuinely believe now i see it so much in wider society that we are we are losing that connection not just to oneself but to everybody around us obviously that's been amplified as well now with what's happened over the last three or four years in terms of the, you know, the COVID situation um, and, and what a barrel of laughs that was and, and, and the disruption that it caused and the pain that it's caused for people. Um, and so, you know, the, the work now that you're doing is, is just, is just so important. It's so important. No, well, thank you, Reese. It, it's, you've got about connection again. And you mentioned the word religion and that's really interesting because what I've realized the Petition that I started when I was national president to add content on death, dying, and bereavement to the national curriculum. So we gained over 10,000 signatures. Um, the support we gained, what well, I got was fascinating. It was wonderful. You know, celebrities getting involved, BBC, ITV, you know, it, re- it really, people got behind it, which is incredible. And I've been reflecting on it, thinking like, why is there such a need for this? Um, and why hasn't there been before? Like Victorian era, we said we had a better connection with death in the Victorian era. And they apparently, First and Second World War, created this disconnect in society with death because the death, death was such, was such a colossal time and a horrendous time for people. So it was kind of like, we can't deal with this anymore. We've got to just put that over there. So that's when the de- detachment started. But I do think religion, without going too deep and heavy here, Reese, has a part to play in also disconnect within society. Because if you think about the purpose of a church, Reese, the church is a place of community. So even if the kids aren't that religious, because most kids aren't that religious, like young kids, but they would go there and they would see so-and-so neighbours, they'd see the so-and-so from the village or the town and would arrange the bingo night for a few weeks' time. And actually what that was, it was a a platform and a foundation to be together. Um, And whilst you're there, you're being talked to about death, actually. Death is being brought up in your hymns, you're singing. It mentions life after death, about going to heaven and whatever your religion might be. The point is, on about community and connection, over half of the UK population now are now non-religious. So the facts are in front of us. This isn't just what I think. The facts are there to see. We are, we are now moving now into a new society and actually, that's why I think this petition that I started in October 2022 is so important because it's about how we adapt and evolve to what society actually is. There's no point fighting it. People that over half the UK population won't start going back to church. It's not happening. You can, mm. People who are religious can fight it all they want. You might still go to church for the christening. And actually, I was about to say, actually, that under the half, they might class themselves as religious because they're going for the christening and going to the funeral in church. And actually... Mom and dad got married at the church. I want to get married there as well. So what, how do you define religion is, a, is an interesting question. But it all comes back to community and connection. And that, that used to be a source and a foundation to provide our communities with connection. And sadly, it's going. And I think it's important, I say sadly, we just need to know how to create connection. That's what's really important in society. You're absolutely spot on there. You know, uh, I, I actually, I had a conversation um, with somebody on this podcast and it was with a guy called Richard Vopes. You might have heard him or seen him on YouTube. Uh, really interesting and fascinating guy. And, um, you know, we spoke about the, the differences now in, in his generation and the millennials and the Gen Z that are coming through and just how different they are in terms of, you know, his generation, Richard Bogues, he's in his 60s now. So they they went through, you know, what what I call, I call them the last real humans. Um, and everybody else coming through now is sort of this artificial type of human being where we lack togetherness. We lack the idea of community. Everyone's very selfish and individualistic. 
um, and very cut off from what it means to be human, be, to be human. Um, yeah. And that was a real fascinating, fascinating conversation. And it's just, it's just interesting you say that, that, you know, religion and go into a place where everybody comes together and they talk and they, you know, it's celebration. It's even just, even just banal conversation. It just makes you know and, uh, and feel as there's, there's people there, you know, we're all in this together. We're not, we're not just individuals. Yep. So, so do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so what do you, what do you reckon then, John is, um, is, is, so you mentioned that you're going into schools then, which just sounds very exciting and you're trying to get, or you're trying to get into schools. Is that, is that correct? Or are you trying to set some kind of education platform up there? So my talks now all over the UK, I'm clearly stating that some schools in the UK are doing what I'm suggesting, what the petition was set out to do. But what I'm trying to to happen, what I'm trying to see happen is a mandatory session to tie into the latter end of primary school, the beginning of secondary school, to tie in with sex education. And what I say is we learn about how life begins in school, so let's learn how it ends. Um, and that will be to discuss the emotions we go through when we lose someone we love. Again, in an age-appropriate way, which is really, really important. Kids will, and like some people, I've met a couple of people, you know, uh, who said to me, oh, just let kids be kids, John. And my view is, of course, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a father of three kids. I've got two boys and a girl from six years of age, four and, and six months old. Do you not think I want to protect my children? What I see, though, with overprotection, we can cause damage. That's the, that's the, the facts yeah. of, of what I'm saying. And, I, and again, I see it now. The reason why I know it's correct is I've got 70-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 80-year-olds getting in touch with me saying, John, thank you for what you're doing, John, because I was not allowed to go to my grandmother's funeral 50, 60 years ago because they were trying to protect me. I, wasn't even, I didn't even know that my dad died. I'm getting, these, I'm getting emails from all over the world. Um, so thank you for doing this. People in America, they want to see it over there now as well. So it's not, and it's really important as well, Reese. that I'm not saying that all children should go to a funeral service or be involved. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we should communicate the message. So also back to schools. Sadly, in the town that I live, um, we, a, a teacher died recently, um, only a young lady. And I, and I was asked, I was approached by the school where she worked at. And I was asked to go into the school to support the school. So I called, we spoke, I spoke to the head teacher and said, well, to you, what, what does that look like to you? I've got some ideas, but what do you think, first of all, before I influence you, what do you think that looks like? So, well, we just, I, we don't know. He said, I don't know, John, but I just need, I need some help. And I've been told to speak to you. So, okay, well, how would, would, would it help if I come and speak to every class of the whole school? I'm happy to do it. I'll put a day aside. I could come on the day before the funeral and speak to the children about why we have the funeral service, where their teacher has been since she died, how we're helping them, and actually what I did with them. I, I, got, I got them, well, about connection points again, Reese. I got them, to, I created connection for them, for their teacher who died, for their family. So they actually did a gift using their fingerprints on these small wooden hearts, which I gave to the family the following day. Again, that was a surprise for the school and the family. But what I saw on the day of the funeral, we went to the church, to the school on the day of the funeral, as requested by the family, and the head of the school with two children gave the family this jar full of these wooden hearts with fingerprints on. And for me, that is completion. That's completion. What I witnessed, is, and I didn't mention that I, what my involvement was, they knew I was there the day before talking to them all, but it was about the school and it was about the family it's about the community truly connecting together. And I don't, I haven't, there's not many things I've seen that's, that's powerful. Um, and that's what life for me, that's what life's about. And that's what I really get excited about is creating connection for people. And actually in the, in the darkest moments in life, I still think you can find light. And I, and I, I believe I'm an example of that. Uh, what happened to me as a child, my mom's death now for me is my fuel and fire. I'm like, watch this, like, try and stop me, try and stop me now, like, and all I want to do now is just try and empower the people and help other people, help society, because I think society needs helping now more than ever. 
So with the school going into the classrooms, I, I, I asked to do it by class deliberately so I could adapt my communication accordingly. So mm -hmm. the recept so I went to the reception class, you know, I've got a son that's four. So I was aware of their mindset at that age. And obviously it's a very young age, very delicate, very delicate age. And we talk about kids being resilient. We've got to be careful using those sort of words, resilient. There is an element of it's black and white, but just because you can deliver them information and they just take it, it doesn't mean they're resilient. It means that they're sponges. So that night I was absolutely exhausted because I was aware every word that came out of my mouth was being examined and being absorbed and not just by the by the the um the children but also the teachers so i think they were quite apprehensive because then it's never happened before so everyone's a little bit on tender hooks it's about creating reassurance creating calmness creating clarity um kindness and to talk with love and connection and it was really really moving to talk to these children um the reception class you know, I spoke to them and the teacher, the head teacher of the school has been incredible. I always communicated the message to the children throughout. Um, but I spoke, and I used that as I started to just explain who I was. I took my top hat with me and I said, I'll be wearing this tomorrow and about the funeral, about the hearse, what a hearse is. And, but I had to, you know, I had to say some harsh words like she has died, you know, she, and I, I say it once or twice, but then move towards she's passed away. What, what was their, what was their reaction, John, when you said that? She, they, they, well, obviously they're already aware because their, their head teacher has already communicated this, but it was just about me reinforcing the message and actually to reassure them. So I, I, I took a toy hearse with me as well and I showed them, this is what I'll be in tomorrow. It'll be a bit bigger tomorrow, I hope. Um, but this is what I'll be in tomorrow. When you see me tomorrow in this top hat, if you want to say hello, John, or give me a wave, you can do, it's fine. And, um, and then we talked about the funeral, why it's so important. It's a platform for the family to be together so they can move forward together and they can show how much they love their mum. It's really important that it's really important. Um, and actually it's what also kids, it's really hard, but actually in life guys, hard things are often really important as well. Um, so we talked about that. Um, we spoke about, I spoke to them about themselves saying that, you know, I don't need to worry about your teacher. Obviously I used her name throughout. I went for this podcast. I don't need to worry about her because I promise you, I take responsibility for looking after her. And I, and I really mean that as well. Um, th then we talked about their emotions and I explained about the support that, that's there for them. That um, myself and my, co and my friends, Kirsty Hurst Knight, she's a counsellor in Bridge North or Shropshire, safeguarding vulnerable children. She, I asked her to come with me as well for my kind of protection. And she, she was fantastic as well. Um, but having her there was just a great support, really. I, was like, you know, I, I told the kids, you know, your, your new friend, Kirsty's here for you as well. The teachers are all here for you. So I brought them all together, really, which is really good. Mm. Um, and actually, I said, I've got a present. I've got a gift. I want, I've got a, a big ask from you all guys to see if you can help me help tomorrow's funeral for the family. I want you to help me. Do you think you can help me? And they were like, yeah, yeah. It's a great, that's really good news. So then we did these fingerprints and, it was real, you know, it's very special, very hard. One of the hardest things I've ever done, um, but really important. The following day, when we get to the school, they go, hello, John, hi, John. Um, you know, and that's a hearse with a top hat on. Very formal, you know, the traditional formalities were gone. Yeah, yeah. It was connected. So it was wonderful. Uh, the questions I was asked, questions such as, what, are her children okay? Who's taking care of her children? Um, so I explained about her family unit and how much care she's got. Um, and I obviously went to that quite a lot because I don't want them worrying about, about the family, especially the two young girls. And actually then when we went on, she, one of the questions was, how did she die? Which is really, really um, important to answer correctly as well. I, I didn't go into the depths of it all because that's, that's not for me to go into with children. It's not for them to know. But I just said that she's re she got really, really poorly and really, really sick. Uh, and my mom who died was the same. She got two really, really poorly. But it's really important for you all to know, guys, that being alive, being here and alive, actually getting ill is part of being alive. So don't you all worry now because, you know, it's so rare that someone dies. It gets really, really, really poorly and sick. At that point, a young girl put her hand up. I was like, yeah. She said, my grandmother got really, really poorly and sick, and she's now fine, John. 
was like, there you go. You see everybody? Her grandmother's fine. So don't think you get poorly and sick. Don't you don't, don't anyone worrying here. We get coughs and colds all the time. It's very rare that this happens. So again, it was about re- creating reassurance for them all, but also being really honest as well. So that's really important. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned honesty there because I was just about to say that it's isn't it funny how we tend to lie so much to children about just life in general, you know, lots of different things. Um, and then we try, we're all in the guise of protection and we wrap them in cotton wool and we don't want them to face the music, so to speak. But actually, you know, being exposed to it or not in the literal sense, maybe, but in a theoretical sense, um, you know, you can actually just, it just, it's just so beneficial um, in, in many, many ways, many ways. So, so I get, I get calls now from people saying that, John, how do I tell my children that granny's died or that she's got cancer? And like, I'll explain to them, you've got to be really honest, but honesty, it doesn't mean you have to be brutal. You can be honest, but when you communicate, you speak with the most, every ounce of love and kindness in your body, you're going to use it right now. And that's, that for me, that's, that's it. That's the answer to it all. Back to being honest and, and sort of building trust. You know, my wife gives me a hard time because like I struggle with Santa Claus for the kids because, you know, yeah. I'll be careful where this podcast goes or who sees this. But you want about building trust with people. You know, we, we, we start a someone's life by telling them a lie. I know people who watch this will argue with me. And I said, we celebrate Christmas. Obviously we do. And they get presents, they get spoils. Um, and it's very magical. It is, it's wonderful. It's wonderful time. Just a small print there. It's wonderful. We go and see Santa Claus. It's wonderful. But, you know, we're on about trust here. Like, in, like on about deep trusts. I do question it. I do question it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll leave that one to you, Reese. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right, John. It, it, it's, it, it, it just make you know, I've, I've often thought about it. I never believed in Santa Claus. I kind of worked it out by the age of about five years old when I saw the presents in the wardrobe. And uh, I was like, oh, <laughs> he's definitely not real then. It can't be true. Yeah. <laughs> but, my, um, my, you know, my mom, my mom, I remember I sort of, I was probably about eight or nine. And I said to her, come on, be honest with me now. What's going on here? This isn't true. <laughs> I, mean, I remember she was like, no, 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 of course it, of course it is. I was like, promise you. That we, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. And I was like, come on, if you tell me on the holy picture, I will not tell anybody else. Come on, let's, let's hear it. So I, I pinned her in a corner almost, so that one, bless her. But yeah, um, but yeah it's a tricky one. It is a difficult one. Um, but I know it's probably going off topic slightly, but what about trust and connection? And I think, well, actually, when you find that out, it's like, oh, okay, cheers, guys. Thanks, thanks for that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, so... I'm curious to know this. So, you, you know, you, you, were, you were there and you were talking about, you know, death and everything else. What was their, what was their reaction to it? I'm, cur- I'm sure everybody would be wondering, you know, if you're going into schools and you're talking about this kind of thing, what, what's the overall response that you, get, that you get from the kids at different levels as well? So, so here you go then. This is an example for you. So I spoke to reception and I sat on the floor with the children I explained, I explained who I was again and why I'm here. And again, the, my focus is to speak from my heart, speak with love and kindness. And, um, you know, I explained to them all at any point, I come into the end of my talk now, at any point you feel sad, that's fine. You feel sad. And actually, the school being so honest with you, me telling you what's happening as well, about tomorrow and why we're coming tomorrow, what we're doing that for. And actually, when the hearse comes, if you want to clap, like I think some of you are going to clap when you see her, when you see the coffin. Some of you are going to wave at the coffin. Some of you, if you don't want to do any of that at all, that's fine as well. So we're all different on the outside. We're even more different on the inside. There's no right or wrong with this, guys, okay? So you must do tomorrow whatever is right for you guys when the hearse arrives, okay? There's no right or wrong at all. Um, and I said, the key is, though, just remember, however you're feeling, whatever goes on tomorrow or Next week or in a year's time, your teachers are all here for you. I'm here for you. Kirsty's here for you. We're all here for you guys. Your voice matters. You're being listened to. We all care about you. You, you are cared for, truly. Mm. And, I, you know, true true connection. I remember at the end of it, I had lots of questions. Um, you know, my grandmother died. 
few years ago and we found it really sad. I said, it is sad. It is really sad. And that's why we need to be even more kind to each other, guys. And actually, when things get tough and tight and hard, you know, you've got a chance now, guys, in this room to be even more kind to each other. And I think if you do that, I think we can make the world kinder as well. It just it just keeps flowing out. And anyway, we've finished. And like, one more question. Yes, yeah, yeah. And this little boy, he said, um, can I give you a hug? And I was like, yeah, of course you can, mate. Obviously, all the teachers are there. And I was a little bit like, <laughs> you've got to be very careful. Very, I'm very aware of that. But like, obviously, yeah, yeah. so the night there's five or six kids giving me a hug. So it was very, very special, very moving. It's very hard to explain it, really. Like that night, I was exhausted um, because it was so emotionally um, important. It was just so important to get the communication and the, the care correct. Uh, and we achieved it. Isn't that interesting, though, John? Their response to it, you know, yeah. it wasn't a case of it wasn't like, um, you know, they broke down in tears and they were just so upset. And my 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 cousin is scared of dogs because his parents were scared of dogs. Interesting now, my cousin's kids are scared of dogs. Is sorry, my cousin's kids are now scared of dogs. Isn't so that like, interesting? There's a there's a cult. Yeah, there's a culture there, isn't there? It's like we. We pass things on to our children because that's what we're used to. But actually, it's about how we break the cycle. You know, dogs aren't dangerous, you know. Um, so they can be. But the whole point of the message is, you know, we have to break the cycle. I think it will take two or three generations until death is normalized in society. And I think when we get to that point, um, I think when we get to that point, I think people will actually treat each other with more kindness and care. And like, I think it's, as important to teach children who don't go through a loss than it is for those who do go through a loss. You know, one in 29, sorry, every 22 minutes in the UK, a parent dies in the UK, every 22 minutes. So that's not including aunties, uncles, siblings, grandparents, and even pets. So that already is quite a, a big number, but actually the ones who don't suffer it, they, they are as, as important to educate. So they have an understanding of what their friends are going through. And actually, if we teach it at a young age, Reese, the adults who become adults, um, they will then know how to communicate to their friends in the streets rather than thinking, oh gosh, so and so is coming across the road. They can have some simple tools in knowing how to communicate to their friends. And actually, guess what? With some simple tools, society is kinder. And actually, that person who's going through that loss actually feels some love and care and kindness. And that has that, those simple things, massive, massive impact. Yeah. It changes things. 100%. 100%. The world would be a much better place if simply if we were just a bit more kinder to, to one another. It's, it's as simple harder. as that. It's not, it's not hard. People, people struggle. I've got so many examples. People saying, that's all good, John, but I'm not sure what to say. But it requires a bit of bravery. But bravery actually isn't required as much when we have education. Just educate people. So, what would what would be um, what would be some useful tools then, John, for somebody who's going through bereavement at the moment and they just can't seem to, you know, move on or or, or, or progress forward? What would you say is, is something useful? So, firstly, everyone's grief and and circumstances are different. I would my advice would be is identify what your needs are. Um, some people, obviously, again, our needs are all different. Um, Julia Samuel, who I interviewed on my podcast, um, sorry, Lucy Hone, who I interviewed on the podcast, uh, Dr. Lucy Hone, she's a TEDx speaker. Um, she designed, has designed a course on this as well. And she basically says there's like different pillars of requirements of human needs. And an example of this, one of the needs is like physical contact. One of her clients who who carried out her course with Lucy, um, her physical need was her husband died and having no one in bed with her, just next to them, was absolutely tearing her apart. So when people say, oh, whatever you need, give me a call, let me know if I can help, it's actually identifying then who these people are that I truly trust and actually I know I've got my back no matter what. And then looking at these people going, right, where can I put so-and-so? in my list of needs. So she actually created like a rotor of two of her closest friends to sleep in the same bed as her for a, over a period of a few months. So it's actually creating a plan. 
And with planning, it's about taking control. And with control, you move forward. Because grief is just completely, you just, there's no control at all. You've, you've literally, your whole world has been tipped upside down. So, that, that, you know, there's, there's simple things there. Simple acts of kindness for people to offer. You know, if you're not sure what to say, take some food around, take a bowl of lasagna, make some lasagna, leave it on someone's door, and then just text them, I've left this on the door for you, thinking of you. You know, those sort of simple acts, even if they hate lasagna, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Make them a cake, all gluten-free. It doesn't matter. It's about showing that intent that you care. Uh, and that's, that's all we want as humans. We want to know we're being thought about. We want to know that we're cared about. Uh, it doesn't require a lot. You're making lasagna anyway. One of, one of the greatest lines, John, sorry to interrupt you there, but you, what you said there is really important. I just want to touch on it. Uh, some, someone said this to me years ago. Uh, every human being has an invisible tag around their neck saying, make me feel important. Yeah. And that is, and, and, and what you said there, you know, it, it, it's just showing a simple act of kindness, showing that you, you are actually thinking about this person. You know, you are in the minds, you are, you are needed, you are wanted. Uh, but yeah, carry on. Sorry. No, 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 I, I totally agree. I totally agree. So for someone who's going, who is actually suffering bereavement at the moment, who's actually grieving at the moment um firstly my sort of key advice to them is don't be, be kind to yourself so if you're having a really bad day you feel like you're not moving forward what i've learned is um actually having a bad day or if someone needs to be in bed all day crying and what i need to, what i'm trying to say to people actually crying is actually moving forward it's actually taking steps the people that just put themselves into work 100 hours a week um, and think that's moving forward, grief will get you at some point. So actually having these bad days is actually part of it, unfortunately. That is you acknowledging. That is you having a bad time. But actually, when you love somebody, it's going to bloody hurt. So unfortunately, you can't escape that. So I would say to people, you know, learn to sit in that grief, uh, accept those bad days, um, and actually, over time, you just have less bad days, and that's moving forward. Some real practical stuff. I'm a massive believer in getting outside, no matter what what level of physical condition you're in. Go outside for a walk, 15 minutes. Nobody has ever done a physical exercise and then regretted it. No one has ever ever regret, regretted doing a physical exercise. So go for it if you can, if you can run. Go for a run, 20 minutes. I promise you, it will help you. 100%. There are connections between the tablets of antidepressants and the same re results, the same um, levels of, of support you get from when you go for, when you actually carry out physical activities. One's natural and one's not. So, you know, I'm not, by the way, I'm not against medication. I'm just saying doing it, doing it naturally for me, that's how we really truly move forward. And it doesn't require a lot to go for a 10 minute walk. And actually, even if you're in a wheelchair, going get some fresh air, going outside in the light. And these things can really, really change your mindset. And changing your mindset is how you move forward. Yeah, uh, it's really important, you know, that we have practical steps. And again, you know, it, we're not educated on this. I, I What you said there to me is actually made a, a complete, a lot of complete sense. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people will find that really valuable because getting outside into nature, reconnecting with the world, reconnecting with people, you know, even if it is just for five minutes a day or 10 minutes or whatever, you know, that can be really useful and really valuable to somebody. And, and finally, Breeze, what's really important is to remember that when someone dies, it doesn't define the end of a relationship and connection. And this is really, really important now I'm about to say. Because I think some people don't quite get grasp the magnitude of what I'm about to say, or they don't quite believe it. Um, physically, the connection has gone. We are, they are no longer there to hold their hands or to, you know, to give them a kiss uh, or to talk to physically. But again, emotion and connection and love that carries on. And this this is really really correct. This is true and correct. So love and emotions it doesn't physically it doesn't stop. Sorry, it does not stop. Physically, yes. Emotional love will always carry on. So it's understanding 
it's understanding there's a there's a, there's a, a massive change in your future with that with that person. Physically, they've gone. Emotional love carries on. And those those words there, that's what I really tell people to try and remember. Uh, it's hard because we're used to having them there and and going for the beer with them or, you know, going out for dinner or if they're our, our close relationships, literally being in the home with us. So it's, it's that loss and separation, which is so difficult. But as I say, love and emotion, it simply can't stop. It carries on for a lifetime. So it's about understanding that. And these small connection points I've mentioned to you already, if you can bring those into your life now uh, to tell that person with you, then that can help as well. Um, journaling as well, C- creating a journal, a grief journal, or just, you know, to call it a grief journal, just putting your putting your um, your mindset, how you're feeling down on paper. There is something about carrying out the physical activity of writing stuff down that can really help. It gets it out of your brain puts it on paper so it can help you today straight away getting it off your chest getting it down it can help you over a short period of time because you can measure your progress or actually how bad things are you can see where you're at but actually what i think is really really important and really positive in five years time you can use it to look back on and think wow look how far i have come so actually you can use it. You can use it to be really proud of, like a journal to be proud of in the future. So there's a few ideas there as well to use. Really useful stuff. Um, you know, w- one thing that I'm curious to get your perspective on is we've touched, we've touched on it already, you know, the religious aspect, spirituality aspect of it. Um, what do you think of in comparison now, so modern society and how our ancient ancestors, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but how their connection to to death and the afterlife, you know, how it's so different from back then to now. Have you noticed those differences? Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, everyone's busy now booking holidays. You know, people people don't want to to think about death. We're all too busy having too much fun. Um, fun, you know, inverted commas. Yeah, exactly. Because because the social media, um, people comparing their lives to other people, this perfect life on, on Facebook and social media, it doesn't exist. It's not real. You know, we have these, we have highs and lows. That's part of life. But again, you don't see the lows really on, on social media. It's people by the pool or, you know, the perfect family picture. Um, so, yeah, there's, it's dangerous. It's creating a false economy. Um, historically, again, we had we had that community and connection a lot more, which I've spoken about. I have great fears about society's connection and disconnects. And as I say, that's why this petition is so important to me because I think it's an opportunity to reconnect and you know make our make our look make us talk help us talk to our neighbour. These acts of kindness again. If you think about historically about our connection with death, you know I think back to the pyramids. And, they, and they, you know, the Egyptian times, you know, the pyramids really, obviously there's questions about how they were built and I know all that, but actually there are deceased people in the pyramids. So every day when you, in Egypt, when you're walking around, you've got, a, you've got a cemetery right in front of your face, really. So death is with you all the time, all the time. Um, you know, having this unattended direct cremation now, there's no funeral service at all. That's basically a saying, we can't deal with that. You know, I, I don't need to deal with it anymore because life's busy. And actually, I've, I've got a solution to a, to, a, to a difficult thing. I've got an answer now. But unfortunately, we have to do difficult things. It, it doesn't make the pain go away. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's alarming. I find it alarming how we think we've got these easy fixes. Uh, and simply, there is, there is no easy fix to life. Life is full of challenges. It's how we embrace the challenges. And with connection and community with education, um, that's how we grow and, and face the challenges head on. Um, but no one's, got, no one's got a perfect solution to this stuff. No one's got the tool to get through it. Every scenario is different. Every person is unique and different. So therefore, the challenges will always be different. But burying your head in the sand will never fix a problem, is what, is what I'll say. Yeah, there seems to be now a real 
I think it's all down to social media, of course, and the culture that you see online. And there is a massive push towards being positive and, you know, we must embrace positivity. And, uh, you know, that can be interpreted in, in, in different ways, I suppose. And the way that I see it being interpreted by many people is that people ignore now the negative aspects of life. Yeah. They completely dis- they disregard it completely and they try and just focus on the positive. Whereas actually, if you acknowledge the negative, like it's there, like there's no getting away from it. Yeah. Like you have to, well, you have to well, come think, to touch how I like how I would expand on that and go a little bit deeper. I don't pick what you just said there. My challenge to you would be is that positive mindset. It's not saying that we should always be positive because you can't. You know, I'm a very very positive person. I think you are as well. Yeah. Hence, what we're doing. You know, we want to put positivity into the world, and there's there's a real reason for that because I think it's needed. Negativity, um, like you say, you can't avoid that. It's part of life. But the, the thing that I will uh, to ask you and the thing that I really have strong feelings uh, uh, strong feelings on is how we deal with negativity. Because there seems to be now, we're moving into a more victim society. Like, poor me. Why me? What, life is so hard. Why is it always me? Why is it always me? And in my view, it's like my mom said when she was dying. Her view, my mom's words were, well, why not me? Why shouldn't it be me, Chris? Is what she said to my dad. And actually, I find that admirable because actually life is difficult. But so many people now are just blaming it's it's the politician's fault. It's the it's the police, it's to blame the police or blame blame institutions rather than actually looking at themselves. And that's what I get frustrated at. Uh, and actually my weakness is having to, to, to try to understand this victim culture, which I really struggle with. Because I think that's what empowerment is. I'm not saying you can always be positive. You can't be. I'm not. I'm not always positive. I get pressured moments. I have bad times. We all do. When the kids are screaming and because they want to do it now for them, I can't give some positive quote to them and make it all go away. You got to sort it out. Just deal with it, Dad. That's that's life. But it's this whole that again the victim mentality which is creeping in now uh, more and more. And I spoke to Ollie Ollerton about this on my podcasts. Uh, he sees a lot of this now as well, and um, that's what I think is what I, what I find as an issue. Why do you think this is creeping in? Why do you think all this is happening? <laughs> it's a soft one, right? No, it, well, it is a tough one, but life is easy. Life is easy, you know. That's it. Life is life is really really easy. I know people that, you know, they struggle financially, but they've got everything that they want. They go on the holidays still every year. So it's like, well, how bad is life? How bad are things? How difficult actually is life? Um, so, yeah, they say, don't they, that soft times create soft people. Tough times create strong people. So, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's hot. You know, some people think that's harsh words. But, um, and like, you know, it's not masculine, all this masculine and stuff. No, I'm totally, I'm not, you know, totally against that kind of approach. But we've got to be, we, we should be wanting to take on challenges. That's what I'm getting at, Reese. Um, and I see it at work here now, young people. They don't, there's the, the discipline now. People are struggling to iron their shirts, young people, because they just think, well, why? It's about self-discipline, self-respect, self-dignity. And I said to people in the past, young people who come here for work experience, well, not work experience, so actually, um, you know, opportunities here for work. Don't be smartly dressed. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for the business. I said, do it for you. I said, get yourself, get your, your shirt ironed, your shoes cleaned. Do it for you. Nobody else. Do it for your standards. Uh, and you'll feel better, and that's how you'll start to grow as a person. But as I say, it's very difficult to get that mindset into into people um, because there's always an excuse. There's a, 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 what I've done as young people that I'm all about, there's always a problem. There's, there's always an issue why I couldn't do it. And that's what I find a, a struggle. 
there's a there's there's a real interesting. So I was just, I was listening to Jordan Peterson quite a bit, uh, not all the time, but um, he's got some interesting takes on why this sort of behaviour is creeping into society, and it's he puts it down to uh, well, to be fair, you've pretty much said it that you know life is easy, it's convenient, there's no challenges anymore. He puts it in a way where we don't have enough dragons to slay. That those yeah. are his words. You know, day to day now, our dragons, right, in inverted commas, are, uh, oh, I don't know, our shopping didn't arrive on time or my Amazon delivery has been delayed or something, you know. There's, our dragons are so petty and small and so just nonsensical that we, we're, we're actually now trying to create problems. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Greg, right. we're getting coffees. We're getting a cappuccino delivered to someone's house now. You know, it's, and actually when, when it's the wrong milk, like you say, it's a big problem. We're losing the plot, you know, and again, yeah. if we could understand about death and dying and bereavement in, in the curriculum, that's why I believe it can help society. We might start to understand. We might go home that night and say thank you to our parents for all they do for us. We might be grateful for ha- having that love in the house. So it's back to like simple human needs and actually just, being grateful and being kind. Uh, and actually, when you go t- into a restaurant and there's a problem, to not sort of shout at people for getting it wrong, just be, be kind. You know, it's not difficult stuff, this. And it's, yeah, as I said, I, but I am optimistic. This isn't me and you and a big moan here, Reese. This is, this is the reason why I've, I've done the work I have, because I believe it can be shifted. I believe that society can be empowered. And things can can improve like drastically. For sure, mate. For sure. Uh, there's a few more things I want to get into uh, with you, and that is sort of the. I've noticed now as I'm getting older that I've I've become a lot more aware of of, of death, and as well, my own my own parents' uh, immortality, and thinking about you know they're not going to be here at some point in the future. And I don't know whether that's just a natural thing, you know, once you sit, once you hit a certain age, I've just turned 29 a few days ago. Um, and I find myself now, my mind goes to that place. It goes to that place where I'm thinking about it and I'm almost preparing myself for that day, you know, cause it's going to come eventually. Good. Right. I say, I say good. I'm glad you are. It's going to, it's going to come, and I, what I what I want to know is, is that is that a natural thing to happen? Should that be happening, or is there something that I'm ignoring, perhaps in myself? Or no. what do you say? That did you go through some similar? I do all the time. Again, with, with myself doing the job I do. When I'm in the hearse every day, I and I see a coffin behind me. I'm aware one day that's going to be me, but I don't see that as morbid. Oh, glad you do that. I'm like, wow. I feel like the front end of life. I feel like literally so alive and I'm so in tune with, with life. I'm totally, I'm totally awake. I want to squeeze every ounce out of life. So for the fact that you're thinking about the, the, the life of your parents and actually, sadly, that, that one day they're going to die, my answer to you is I'm pleased you are thinking about it because when you see them, guess what? That hug means a bit more. Um, you know, oh, it's yeah. You know, honestly, honestly John, it's it's it's, br- it's hit me in some in some respects. You know, we, we've got we've got young kids now. Um, not me, but my sister. She's got you know a daughter and a and a son. Um, and when I see my my, my dad playing with them, you know, and I just you know I sit back and I observe it, and it's that really gets me, and I feel so grateful that. You know, my ne- my nephew now gets to experience my dad as I did, you know, when I was a kid. Um, it just gets the the wheels turning, and you know, it's it's so it's so powerful, it's so powerful. It makes me appreciate my dad and my parents, you know. So this is my mom. So, so Reese, I'll take it to another level for you, Reese. This is the, this is where I'm at in my head with death. Okay, I can actually picture, I can take myself to my deathbed. I can take myself there. The sound of the hospital equipment on around me, with my children around me, 
thinking like I, I, he hasn't got I can hear their voices like around my bed I can feel my wife's presence there I can feel the love in the room I can feel them all sort of like making sure I'm okay I can I can actually take myself to that point and then what I can do that what I can do then is like shift it and then like I come back around I'm like right let's go let's go like I've got so much to do I'm so excited about life so people say to me oh, that's morbid honestly I am living you know I've got so much so many opportunities so many projects like a, a book being released this year about grief um a website tool to help you put your wishes down um and actually just the basics of how I take care of people who die here and actually how we take care of the deceased when no one's watching, like that true care, how we look after their families according to our care, how I give children a voice and say your voice matters and actually show them, you know. And it's because I can see the end game. I can see the end the end game. I can see it. I can feel it. Uh, so for me, I don't see that as morbid. I'm truly, the chains are off. It's true liberation here. I'm truly living. I'm, honestly, it's it's great. It's wonderful. It's, it sounds like you're very, very free, mate. You've oh. you've come to terms with it. You've come to peace with it. It's like you're not frightened of it whatsoever. I'm In fact, I'm, like you're actively actively embracing it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I want to I want to high five my lads. I want to grab their hands say, as I'm literally, and I want to say, lads, go and smash it, boys. It's been an absolute ride. <laughs> go and smash. Go and smash it. Go and smash it. Live properly. And honestly, it's if anybody who argues this with me, uh, please contact me. Tell me I'm wrong. I'd love to yeah. talk to you because I'd love to get. I would love to know your mindset and like how I'm so wrong. I'd love to know about about it because, as I say, it's true for me. It's true liberation. It's properly living. It sounds like it because you know what we're what we're sort of really dealing with here is relinquishing fear that's all we're yeah. doing we we we're letting go of that fear um yeah and you don't you don't necessarily have to believe in the afterlife or or anything like that you just need to be comfortable with the idea that one day I'm not going to be here and that's okay that's fine that's fine and actually what's great is whilst I'm here let's do some great things Let's like love let's people definitely. properly. Let's let's be really kind to people. Let's try and make the world a bit better whilst you're here. You know, if it's a small, small amount, if it's a big amount, whatever you can do to make it a bit better, happy days. You know, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Of course. I'm 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 um a few a few years back I did something. Um so I did a very high dose of magic mushrooms. Okay. Now it, <laughs> this is on this is on topic. I promise you. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I sort of, you know, I I don't know if you've ever done magic mushroom before, but um, you know, never, it's... Never, I'm ex-military, eight years navy, and I've never ever touched the drug. But you know what? I'm actually um, there's a comedian I'm going to see later this year. Paul Smith, I think his name is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, Paul. He talks about this on one of his stand-up shows about how he took one of these drugs and, you know, it changed his life forever. Um, Ollie Ollerton, um, who got to know, he he went to, um, where is it, like South America to do like a, a natural drug. And yeah, again, I, 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 I was good with it. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And I, that, yeah. he told me in detail about what happened to him. Um, he got attacked by a chimp when he was a kid, and then he nearly died. I remember and, listening to the story when I watched it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. He, and so, like that, it's fascinating how he became the chimp's mum, you know. And yeah, it's it's out there. But actually, like I could say for me, it's about just being liberated. I haven't needed to do any of that, um, which is great. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I mean, I mean the whole reason why I brought well. Is because uh, you know, there's lots of research now about how doing just a simple. So let, let's say you know you've come, you, you, you're at the end of your life, and you've got that anxiety, and you know you, there's a fear. What they're experimenting with now in America is taking a high dose of mushrooms when you're at the end of life, 
to relieve that anxiety to to almost you know give you a sense of of, of what it might be like you know to to take that last breath and to and to pass on and people have found it incredibly useful interesting um very interesting yeah very interesting um in particularly around what Ollie Ollerton says about uh, ayahuasca and all that stuff i'm very deep into all that and uh, i love the idea of it and it's just about you know going into an altered state of consciousness and and just seeing you know what what lies beneath you know down in down in the unconscious and then letting it come forward i think all this comes back to self-awareness that's what it all comes down to is like yeah. and like being truly self-aware with those kids I talked about in the school that I spoke to, the self-awareness I had to show, it, it, I was exhausted in the evening. I could hardly speak at home. I was, I was literally done because I had to use everything in my body and mind and soul to make sure I communicated correctly. So very, very difficult. So you, you've, um, you've touched on quite a bit, John, to be fair, and it's, all, it's incredibly fascinating. You, you've uh, you've mentioned as well that you're on the or you're a past director or past board member of the National Association of Funeral Directors, and yes. and they're they're doing incredible work. Would you mind going into sort of a bit of a spiel about what they do and and how that can help people? So the National Association of Funeral Directors it's a, an association which overlooks um, over four, four and a half thousand funeral homes. I had the great honour of having a year, a year as president of the association. Um, it was formed in 1905, um, and and yeah, it's just a, it's a group of people and uh, being together as a as a, an exec member, which I am, and in moving the industry forward in a in a sort of healthy, positive um, direction. To, to make sure that the funeral directors are looked after in a, in a sort of supportive manner, but also, most importantly, the bereaved are take, taken care of. Um, and I do this as well with my training, as I, I do I carry out for funeral directors as well. So, so yeah, it's a fantastic um, association. I feel really honoured to be involved and being part of that association. I've had lots of wonderful opportunities, Buckingham Palace through to going to America. Um yeah, it's been a it's been a really a real pleasure. And as well, you've also been involved with the Child Bereavement UK as well. Are you, are you heavily involved in that charity? So yes, yeah, so in March last year, twenty twenty three, um, based on the petition um, and the work that I, I've sort of been doing around sort of bereavement awareness for children, um, that I was approached by them to become their their funeral industry advisor to child at uk so i i do i do training for them and i sort of i'm just like um a friend slash advisor to them um all funeral related information and advice and guidance so i want to bring it all together you've got all these fantastic sort of institutions doing wonderful work but actually if you can bring them together it's even more powerful the work the work it gets even better and that's what we're seeing now. So it's fantastic. For sure, mate. For sure. Well, I think um I think what you're doing is is absolutely fantastic, mate. Um, more power to you. And uh, I really hope that the channel takes off and and, uh, and and gains more traction. Um I think changing the conversation around death, uh, our perspective, our outlook on it and connecting more with it, it's only gonna make things a lot more better. Um most people's perception of it is oh it's morbid it's dark it's it's negative whereas actually what we've just described there it can be a wonderful positive thing for people definitely sure. thank you thank you reese as i say it's i admire the work you're doing as well keep shining the lights on what you're doing and um and thank you so much for having me on podcast really appreciate it no worries john thank you very much for joining me mate